ahead. Uh, thanks everybody for, for being here. This is our last TMYS uh, workshop of the year. So it's been wonderful uh, getting to know everybody and uh, working with all of you. So thanks everybody for your time and engagement on this. And we're really happy to have uh, Alice and Candy uh, facilitating today's workshop about academic life. So with that, I'll let them get to it. Thanks, Susan. Um, Alice and I were asked to speak for 15 minutes and maybe we'll go on for more than that. But anyway, this is gonna be very small nutshell, right? To um, provide a little bit of uh, guidance for what could be a 40 or 50 year academic career. Um, so we thought we would start off with the academic job search. I realize that some of you are already searching for a job, um, but we thought we would just cover a few things here. Um, some factors to consider um, are that business schools and engineering schools, or maybe math departments or other departments that are closer to engineering, are very different from each other. First, teaching can be very different. Um, in an engineering school, you would typically be teaching technical courses to students who have you know, reasonable quantitative backgrounds, but in business schools, the students can be really quite diverse. Um, they don't necessarily have um, strong math capability, so how you teach, the content of what you teach could be quite different. Um, research areas are also quite different. Um, in engineering schools, usually there's some expectation of doing technical work that kind of follows on your dissertation. In business schools, the expectations can be really quite different. And so it's very important to understand um, what is valued within the organization to kind of think about how do you gradually um, modify, if necessary, the trajectory of the types of research topics that you're working on. Um, most business schools do not require major research grants, um, whereas in engineering schools that can often be necessary. Um, and there's there's a big spectrum there. Service varies widely too. Most engineering schools really expect some level of service in business schools. Often they're they're very large and there's a lot of administrators who can uh, cover many of those tasks. So the service demands are much lower in business schools. Um, as you think about uh, where you go, um, interactions with colleagues are very important. You may want to find out about what's the nature of research collaboration. Do people within the department work with each other or do they collaborate with people outside? Um, what's the nature of departmental decision making? This is something that you know I didn't really think to ask about. But I know now that it's very important to at least understand how decisions are made so that you can adapt to the situation. Um, every department has a different working and social environment. So these are things that you can ask about, um, especially, uh, say, relatively new assistant professors who can tell you about you know, what, what they're experiencing um, at, in that role. And then it's helpful to understand uh, what things are like beyond the department or beyond the college or school. What kind of administrative support does the university provide, for instance, in terms of getting research grants and the like? Are there good linkages between the university and research labs or corporations um, if your work goes in that particular direction? Okay, and what's the typical application process? Um, usually the applications are due in the fall, sometimes as early as um, September or October, but more typically November, December. Um, most applications require um, a CV, a teaching statement, uh, not only uh, what would you like to teach or what are you capable of teaching, but your philosophy about teaching. Um, a research statement, what are you planning to do and what do you want to be known for? Copies of one, two or more research papers. Um, it's increasingly common for universities to ask for diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging statements to explain what your 
experiences? What type of contributions have you made thus far? And what is your philosophy on this? And you need to arrange for three or four letters of recommendation. This would typically be from your people on your dissertation committee or people, you know, faculty you've, you've worked with along the way. Most schools will do short conference or video conference interviews before they decide whom to bring to campus for interviews. And then campus interviews usually span one to two days, including a seminar, meetings with faculty, possibly some even outside your area. Sometimes, uh, usually a department chair, sometimes a dean, sometimes PhD students, sometimes undergraduate students. So they, you should ask who's going to, you know, who's on your schedule and to find out beforehand um, to get some information about them. And particularly, you want to know who's going to be at the seminar because you may need to adapt your the the seminar material to account for the fact that you know, may, maybe the audience is much broader than uh, what you anticipated, or especially if there's going to be students there, um, you may want to make some adaptations for that purpose. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Alice here. Okay, thank you, Candy. So I have uh, three slides and there are just some kind of, I think, ideas about trying to be successful in the what they call the, the legs of the three-legged stool. That's the traditional academic thing, teaching, research, and service. So I started with teaching. I think it's really important to show your enthusiasm um, for whatever you're teaching and um, Make sure your students know you're happy to be there uh, because they really respond uh, to somebody who feels like they're, they're, you know, glad to be able to share learning and coach them and, and be part of a team. Uh, I think active learning is really important. Um, I teach, you know, my class sizes are not really small. They're, they're not enormous, but you can't do individual work with students like one-on-one, -on -one, but there's ways to do short exercises where you can do little teams and so on. And I incorporate that because if they just sit there for 50 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes um, passively, they're, they're not really engaged physically or mentally. I've also found that they really like extra credit. Undergraduates, um, are willing to work more with an opportunity to improve their grade. I don't like just giving away points. I don't grade on a curve. So, but I feel like if students want to show that they've accomplished certain things under extra credits, a really good way. So in terms of, of you as starting new, um, you've got to work with your department chair, uh, and also whoever is doing the class scheduling about new preparations. They take an enormous amount of time. Um, and unfortunately, as a new person, you're almost invariably gonna be doing new preps, but I've also seen newer faculty members somewhat abused, if I can say that, where they're getting new preps constantly. And it's, it's very detrimental to not only their time availability, but they don't have a good chance to teach the same class again and again. And, and you, you do get better each time and you make the class better. I think teaching is like a gas. It will fill any volume you allow it to. So you, you need to think about um, drawing some limits um, in terms of prep time for class, in terms of student interaction time. That doesn't mean you should be unavailable or you should not be dutiful about teaching, but you've got to set some structure. Otherwise, you're likely to spend the vast majority of your first semester or two engaged only with teaching uh, and ignoring research. And of course, this is especially important if you're at a research institution, which Candy and I are both at research institutions. So we do have that perspective. Um, I think teaching assistants are really important and all of our classes have teaching assistants. I rely on mine a lot, um, but you do need to mentor and develop them 
Do not be afraid to tell them what's expected. Do not be afraid to tell them when they have fallen short, but then also praise them when they do well and give them opportunities. Um, you've got to set up your grading when you're setting up your syllabus and, and think about what do I want to grade? I stopped grading homework about eight years ago because students would just cheat and trying to police on it was just not worth the um, the pain. So instead I've gone to uh, a series of quizzes, like smaller quizzes, module by module. Uh, if you are, especially at a research institution with graduate programs, you need to think about uh, graduate students and recruiting and educating and start mentoring and developing your team of graduate students. This takes a while. So I think it's important your first semester and two to kind of identify some students that might be good uh, to work with. Um, you've got to get the sense of your culture in your department. My The culture I was at when I was a new professor was that um, the senior people got first choices of, of the new graduate students, and, and I didn't know that, so I got crosswise, uh, I can say honestly, with one or two of the senior people uh, for kind of trying to, to take or, or make overtures to students they had their eyes on. Uh, my current department's not that way, it's just everyone's open, but you need to understand that and then I'm not saying you have to necessarily follow the culture, but you need to be aware of it and, and see how it works, how to would-be advisors make matches with graduate students. Um, personally, I decided about hmm, 10 years into my career that I would stop working with master's students who weren't going on to get a PhD because I just found no matter how good they were, they weren't there long enough to really do um, enough research and to result in something tangible. So I and I just work with PhD students only, but, but that's, you have to figure out your own model. And teaching alone isn't gonna get you tenure and promotion at most institutions. And it's a diminishing return in terms of the time you put in. So you wanna put in, enough time to get you, you know, near to the level you want to be, which would hopefully be a good solid teacher. But maybe to get to that extra, she's the best teacher I've ever seen, it would take an enormous amount of time and effort. And um, probably you need to devote some of your time and effort elsewhere. Okay. Oh, next one. Sorry, Candy. Yeah. So research. So if you're in a research institution, you should definitely uh, have an understanding of what the expectations are. As Candy already mentioned, there's a lot of strong differences between business schools and engineering schools. Engineering schools, money is a very important uh, component, uh, sponsored research, whereas in business schools, it's, um, it's usually not important or, or much less important. Uh, think about where you're going to publish. Uh, I advocate mainstream highly respected journals because they're gonna build your uh, CV in the way that you would want it to. I personally think there's, you know, some people who get caught up in the numbers game and maybe the quantity becomes more of the motivator, but that can sometimes lead to publications that are maybe not as influential, not as impactful, and, and actually not as impressive. So you, you need to think about it. You need to be savvy about, is this, re, is this journal indexed and scopus? What's the impact factor? Who's on the editorial board? So you do your research before you just decide to submit somewhere. I like to be goal-oriented with research endeavors. Think about the paper or papers that could result. Uh, likely that will change, but at least you're going into it with the goal with whoever you're working with on the research. I also think if you get your paper rejected, which I get papers rejected a lot, um, to have a plan B. And I often strategize with my authors. 
co-authors like, okay, we're going to try here. It's aspirational, but if we don't make it, then we're going to go here. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with that. I found one of the most rewarding things about being academics work with my graduate students. So training them is to be really important. And I think you do have to be demanding and nurturing and kind of a tough love kind of thing where, where you care for them, but you expect their best and, and you let them know uh, where they could use improvement. I think in terms of projects, especially funded projects, um, longer term offers more opportunity for publishing and, and a sustained relationship. I put NSF, but it could be, you could be NIOSH, it could be DOE, whatever you think one of your main funding sources is. Volunteer to be a reviewer. It will it will help you a lot learn how things are done, what, what the dynamics are. Um, and by reading a bunch of proposals and reviewing them, you will become a better proposal writer. I think it's important to have a diverse portfolio both of sponsors and uh, sometimes you're the, the lead PI or maybe even a sole PI. And sometimes you're a supporting co-PI or a, you know, a, a senior personnel. I think all of that is good because you can play different roles. I think it's important to be opportunistic, you know, to think, oh, this could lead to this grant or, or wow, this is cool research that somebody at NSF might be interested in. But you also have to be resilient. Most proposals are rejected. Actually, most papers <laughs> at better journals are rejected. You are gonna get a lot of rejections. The rejections are very impersonal. You don't know who they are. They're usually very critical. I mean, and critical by what I mean is they don't necessarily say the criticisms in nice ways or try to soften it. So you have to develop kind of a hard skin and be resilient um, and try to, you know, take the useful messages and just make your work better. So, but, you know, it can be hard sometimes to, to get over that. Finally, service. Candy, please. Thank you. So, um, at the junior level, service is less important, but it is, uh, you're, you're able to, I think, to form a foundation for your career and, and later on, uh, especially if you go from associate to full and then as a full professor service is really can be a big component. It's a huge component of how I spend my time. And I think, you know, we're an inform, so we're in operations research, management science. And you want to elevate your visibility in the community. And that doesn't mean all of it, because there's many tens of thousands. But think about your particular technical community or your community uh, with uh, affinity and education or something else. And who do you want to get involved with and, and um, volunteer? That Not everything, but think about what can I do well? What would I like to do? Um, and how can I contribute? Um, but if you do contribute, if you volunteer or if you agree to do something, it's really important to do it well and to be responsive and dependable. Because I can tell you, it takes a long time to build a reputation, but it's really easy to make it not so good. Yeah, I worked with her and she never answered my emails and stuff like that. I mean, people remember stuff like that. They will never tell you that, but they do remember. So make sure you you're, you do a good job. I think conferences, especially now that we are finally back to in-person, they are great to be able to meet people firsthand, talk to them informally. When I say wave the flag, that's for your institution. I do a lot of you know that. And Auburn, Alabama, I know you've never been there. You may have never even heard of Alabama much, but we're here and we're doing good things. So sometimes you can do some of that and, and meet and greet at conferences. And even if you aren't naturally the most social person, you know, try to push yourself and, and say this, this is going to be good and, and it could be fun. And a lot of times it is fun. Tenure and promotion letter writers. This is really important. You're going to need anywhere from four to six or more letter writers. And it's best not to wait till that fourth or fifth year to think earlier about who 
uh, could potentially be a good letter writer for you. Think about, you know, as you meet people in service activities and at conferences. I mean, I'm not talking about targeting them or anything, but think about, you know, you know, if they got to know me and or we share a, a research area, then they could be someone good to be invited to review my tenure and promotion case. Let me talk a little bit about internal service. Um, I think, I think especially as a woman, you can get asked to do a lot of internal service. And this is also true for underrepresented minorities. Um, and honestly, it's not gonna get you tenure and promotion. I say minimize, that's probably a little too harsh, but I think you have to think about what you need to do to be a good citizen, but not necessarily say yes to everything. Um, and if you get too overlooked, there's too many demands explained. I, I have to prioritize some other things in my career. So, you know, you be careful with service commitments, both internal and external, um, and try to pick the ones that you are truly interested in. And I think that's the end of my, uh, my little uh, set of advice, if I can say it that way. Thank um, you. Let me just add something more specific about internal service. There are some service activities within a department that can be really valuable for your career. Um, for instance, if your department has a seminar series, outside speakers, if you're on that committee, then you can have some influence on who's coming to your campus to give talks and you can get to know them better. Um, and also serving on PhD admissions committee can be really valuable too, because then you have some influence on, you know, the sorts of uh, applicants who are going to be admitted. Um, so think mm -hmm. carefully about these sorts of things. Um, of course, you probably don't want to do all of them at the same time, but um, I would say those two things in particular can really be valuable for your career in the long run. Also search committees could, or a search committee can mm -hmm. be good. Uh, so yes, that's a great point. Thank you, Candy. So I think we wanna open it up for questions. And I guess you can speak or put it in the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. Can I stop sharing? I think so. I think you can stop sharing. We've said everything on the slides. So I have a, a question to start us off. Um, uh, Candy, you mentioned um, thinking or asking about the departmental decision-making process when you're looking, um, when you're on the, the job market. And Alice mentioned, you know, the departmental culture around how grad students are chosen or assigned mm -hmm. to faculty. And so you know, what are some questions that applicants could ask? What are some things they should be looking out for? Um, I could also imagine the culture for women might be something that's on people's minds when they're looking for jobs. How does how does an applicant get a sense for this? Well, sometimes you just you can just ask a very simple, straightforward question. You know, uh, tell me a little bit about um, the PhD admissions decisions. Well, how, you know, what is that process like? Um, how does your department go about choosing what areas to hire in? Okay, so you can just ask very neutral kinds of questions to sort of get a sense of how things are done. And, you know, I think early on, we're pretty naive and maybe we don't really care, but then a little bit later on, maybe you have feelings about um, what types of situations are um you're you're happiest with right? so um i happen to have a joint appointment between <laughs> um middle size industrial engineering operations research department and it's a not a very big business school but you know 80 plus faculty and so the whole decision making process both sides are very different from each other you know and so in some sense i kind of have to live with both but i really feel like you know in the business school hardly anybody has much of a say because you know decision making among 80 people is just not easy but um in IEOR we all sit around the table 
the junior people get to say what they think too, you know, and um, it's a very collective kind of process. And, you know, I'm happier with that. I just feel like even if I don't always have an opinion about anything, I just feel like um, we, it's easier to function. Everybody knows what's going on, you know. Um, so you have to decide for yourself. Um, but I think it's very easy to ask very neutral questions and just have people tell you so that you understand what it's going to be like when you get there. Now, some of you are going to be interviewing in places where there are no women faculty. Um, and then it becomes hard to find these things out. You may have an opportunity to talk to uh, women faculty in uh, related fields, okay, maybe may a different engineering department or a different part of the business school. And it it may be difficult to ask to speak to such a, such a person, but if you have an opportunity, sometimes that can be helpful. There are times when um, even talking to the staff people who are arranging your interview, you might be able to get some information from them. And they, of course, are not really, you know, they, they're, they're not going to influence decision making. So you don't really have to worry about asking them questions. Oh, yeah. Lauren. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat, too, which I had my my hand raised after. OK, so the, the chat question says, after a candidate has submitted her job market packet, what else can they do post that stage, for example, interviews and flyouts to make a good impression on a, on a school? There's a lot. Alice, you want to take that one? Yeah, so I've been on many search committees. I'm on one now. Um, I think it's really important to show a lot of energy and enthusiasm um, and positivity, but still be realistic. Also be as specific as you can. Uh, most places are now doing Zoom screening interviews or screening interviews at informs. Um, and so you've got to, you know, try to come across in whatever your 10 to 20 minutes are there. And it really makes a good impression if you've done your homework where you, you know the department, some of their initiatives. What does their curriculum look like? What courses do you want to teach? Um, it's very weak if you say, well, you know, I can teach any OR course. I mean, that that doesn't come over very well. So uh, I think that's really important to do your homework. But, and, but, and if you go on campus, um, it's exhausting. It's fun, but it's exhausting because it's just a constant meet and greet. But a real important aspect is the seminar because I've seen candidates who have both really uh, help their chances of being the chosen one and those that have really hurt themselves and really knocked themselves out of contention through their seminars. So work hard on um, what you're gonna present, your timing, um, you know, how much technical depth you're gonna get into, answering questions and so on. And so it's, it's very important to, to spend a lot of time getting ready for that. Um, and then try to deliver it as, you know, naturally as possible. Right. Andy, yeah, so back to you. I, I, I'd suggest um, making sure that you know enough about each of the people you're meeting with so that you can ask them questions about their research, even if it's kind of outside your field, just to know enough to at least carry on some kind of a conversation because I have been in interviews where the person just didn't ask a lot of questions, you know, and we've got a half an hour time slot and how are you going to fill it? So, you know, the most natural thing to do is to ask the person about their research, but then you need to know something to sort of ask some specific questions. Um, and then maybe some backup questions about, you know, the, the department, the school, the university, the community, so that at least you can keep that conversation going for a, a half an hour if you, you have to be in, in the position to, you know, be the driver. Um, you know, Sharon, you have a question. Lauren was before me. Hi, <laughs> Lauren, go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, you're good. No, sorry. I just want to make sure the question in the chat got answered first because they had posted before me. But thank you so much for the talk this afternoon and everything and morning for some people, I think, as well. But um, so what I was curious is that I had heard from someone that whenever you do get a job offer from a school, that a lot of times they're expecting you that you will come back and be asking for more. So whenever you do get an offer, I wanted to ask, what are some key things that you really want to be looking for in like your starter packet? I would say it, it depends on what you think you need. Um, here at Berkeley, I usually, I mean, I was department chair for six years in that EOR. I would usually tell the candidates and figure out honestly what you think you need for your first three years, um, because then the department chair can go and ask the dean or a department can figure out how to come up with that, those kinds of resources. Um, but, you know, be reasonable, okay, nobody's going to give you a billion dollars, right, so you have to be able to justify it, but um, that's what I would do, and, you know, there are places where, for instance, um, all of the PhD students are supported by the department, so then you don't need money to support PhD students in the first few years, maybe you need money for travel to conferences, maybe you need equipment, okay, so you know, just go down the, the whole list and figure out what it is you need and ask for what you need. That's what, what I would do. Um, Alan? So I would also say, you know, you should get a reduced teaching load. I mentioned new preps. That should be something you should talk about. What am I going to teach like over the first few years or what is the plan and negotiate it then? Um, definitely, it's very helpful to get at least one PhD level uh phd level graduate student for a year or two um that they're going to pay for um uh, whatever equipment space is another thing this is always contentious um because mm -hmm. where are you going to develop your lab where are you going to put your students where your team going to be and um at every university i've visited and the ones i've been associated with space is one of the hardest resources to come across. So those are some of the things that you need to think about and um, get your dibs in up front. Because a lot of this stuff, you don't get it coming in, you're not going to get it. You're on your own. Yeah. And, and if I can add, institutions vary in terms of, you know, what the default is. So mm -hmm. so literally everything you, you might need, you probably want to account for, you know, down to the furniture. If you have requirements for certain, uh, for me, I have, a, I, I asked them to cut the legs off of my table to make it short enough for somebody of my stature so I wouldn't have back pain. But so whatever you think you might need, try to, to list it all out and, and probably your advisors can help you brainstorm all the possible things because you can't assume that every institution has some default uh, set up. Yeah, one other big item would be summer salary. Um, mm. Most large business schools provide some guaranteed for some period of time. Um, in engineering schools, it varies all over the map. And so you've got to figure out, um, you know, what the norm is and at least ask for the norm. And if you think you need more than that, then you know, put it on your The list. other thing is, how long do you have to use that summer salary? How many years? And how long is your startup account going to be open for? Because I've seen problems that people have had with that where they haven't spent it in two years and the institution's like, okay, you're done, you know, and then this creates friction. So you need an understanding of that. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for your advice. Another thing I'll just put on the folks radar because, you know, we tend to have a very computational field. You know, some schools have servers that they maintain. Some people need to purchase their own servers. Some schools are trying to push people towards more cloud-based support. So again, that kind of, uh, those costs uh, should be factored in as well. I think Sharon's hand is up. Thank you so much for the great discussion. I actually have two questions. And uh, one is that in the screening phase of the interview, um, I've actually never been to one and um, I don't know what it entails. And uh, what are some factors that are important to consider when going for the screening interviews, either on Zoom or at conferences? Um, are there red flags that we should be aware of? 
And then my second question is regarding teaching, uh, kind of teaching sessions at on-campus interviews. How often do we get to, uh, or do we are we asked to present uh, or present material in terms of a uh, kind of a teaching um, seminar or teaching class um, as part of these on-campus interviews? And uh, if we do that, are they uh, are there certain topics that are um, that you think would be a good uh, topic to teach? Um, well, I'll jump in there first. First of all, we don't ask for any teaching type seminars at my institution, either current or previous. Um, so uh, unless you were interviewing like for a lectureship position or something, but not for tenure stream positions. Um, so that's that. The, the screening interviews, I mean, you only have a short time. So again, you wanna come in prepared. You wanna be specific. Like these are the things that I'm really prepared and excited to teach in your program. This is where my research fits in. Uh, these are the types of funding. Uh, and then of course they may ask you questions, but if you're just totally generic, it's not gonna come out as well. And of course, just again, be positive, enthusiastic, energetic, um, and look professional. I, I threw one guy out from a screening interview at Informs. He doesn't even know this because he came in with both of his shoes untied. And I was just like, <laughs> of course, I didn't say that, but it was like, I mean, guy, I mean, come on. I mean, so I, I, I know, but, but I'm just saying, you never know people on the search committee you know, everyone's a, an individual and, and kind of what's going to appeal to them or, or maybe not appeal to them as much. I will tell you, Zoom interviews are like, to me, the worst of all worlds, because, you know, it's just such a flat environment. You've never met any of these people. Um, and it's so hard to connect. It's, it's, it's difficult, but, and maybe do a couple practice ones before you get on the real one. Um. Typically, both in operations management and in IEOR, when we do the brief interviews, we want to understand the person sort of, let's call it research inclinations that go beyond the specifics of the dissertation, okay, to kind of understand, okay, so if somebody works on some optimization methodology, we kind of want to know what do they intend to go more deeply into this, or do they see themselves as more of an applied OR person? And if so, what you know domains are they interested in? So things like this, it's sort of like, okay, you've done this, but we want to know what you're going to be like three to five years from now in terms of what you're doing. Um, in terms of teaching, um, for the business school, we kind of want to know whether that person is going to be able to hold up to MBA students. Not everybody can, no, not everybody wants to. Um, and uh, whether they can deliver technical material in an understandable way. You know? So that will come through in the seminar. But on the other hand, sometimes we ask questions during these brief interviews just to see whether a person can explain some something in detail from their dissertation work, you know, if we can't understand what they're saying, then, you know, we're just not too hopeful about their ability to, to teach similar material to students. So um, it sort of depends. Um, you know, there are times when we have concerns about specific things. And so then we'll focus more on that. So even though the candidates may get what looks like the same list of questions, they, they get asked in different ways because we are trying to um, get more information. We're trying to figure out what the candidate is like. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, Let's see what we have here. Um, Susan, okay, you're, oh, so Susan's talking about what it is that, like a, do you wanna discuss that? Sure, um, you know, this is not a, a common choice for people in our field, but at undergraduate liberal arts colleges, you're often asked to make a teaching focused either seminar or class session. And so, um, or sorry, student focused seminar or class session. And so um, our 
research talks, uh, we invite students to attend those. And so we're looking to see if it's sort of generally accessible to, to a, an audience that includes undergraduates. And, and sort of we understand maybe an undergraduate might get lost after slide five, but you know, at least can you how long can you keep them, <laughs> keep them in there? Um, and then we usually have them teach a class session and we're really trying to gauge effectiveness in the classroom. Yeah. Um, to your question about choosing a topic, we often specify the topic because we typically slot this person into an ongoing class. And so they're here on a certain day and the topic's going to be X. Uh, but when you get to choose or even within the topic, you wanna try to find a way to make it as engaging as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If there are no other questions, then we can use the last uh, 15 minutes to go into breakout rooms and have smaller discussion if you if you think that would be helpful. Okay, everybody's frozen. Maybe I'm frozen. I'm going to open up the um, the breakout rooms and um, and then you can have a smaller discussion. And then uh, whenever um, the discussion starts winding down. I, I know uh, the students indicated that it's useful to just have some time on Zoom, just the students to sort of debrief after these workshops. So after a little bit of time, uh, the mentors will, will depart and students who are available to stay on can continue to discuss. All right. Okay, so well, there's one more question. She come? Oh. Is there more, another question? Is she on the chat has a Hi. question? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to type it because I'm at the airport. There might be too noise behind. So I'm just going to type it. Or Honestly, I can just ask it if you guys can hear me. So uh, for business, this question is specifically for business schools. Uh, I noticed that in forms this year that typically the evaluation criteria for the research pipeline of the PhD job market candidate would typically be one r and r But post-COVID, I saw that there was a lot of increase in the candidates who were getting a lot of interviews, had two papers in advanced stages of uh, the review process. So I wanted to get a sense of how that's changing. Is this something temporary? Should we uh, possibly account for this as we go about completing our PhDs? Or is it OK to still stick to the one R&R &R, uh, baseline? I think the candidates who have been coming out in the past year or so have been in school a bit longer just because they didn't really want to go out at the front end of the COVID pandemic. Um, and I think that, I mean, I think we've seen that it's just taking people longer. But what I've seen too is that there are people opting to spend a year as a postdoc at um, Google or some, or some research institute so that they can get their papers into the review process before they um, you know, start an academic job. Um, it's still taking long to get papers published. And so you kind of have to think about what is your resume gonna look like when you come up for tenure? And Ellis did mention quality matters, but having one high quality paper is probably not going to get you tenure. <laughs> you, you're gonna need more than that. Um, and so I think that it's kind of a, I think you need something to, okay, number one, you need to have at least a working paper to send, okay? They, you have to have something that they, they can read that looks like it's in a complete form. Um, I think it can be helpful to have submitted that already because then you're, you have feedback from other people as well, and maybe you've been able to incorporate the comments. Um, but, you know, it's all over the map. I mean, we get applicants with no papers, I mean, no published papers and no accepted papers, and then other people that have three or four. And, you know, we don't always hire the people who have three or four just because they don't fit what we're looking for or we're not impressed with the quality of the work and so forth, you know. So I don't know. I think that the number is just a, I don't know, it's just a target, right? It's not, um, there's nothing hard and fast about it. Mm 